happy Easter Sunday. Happy Resurrection Day. I am so glad that y'all took the time to be with us here today. This is a special Sunday. It is Easter Sunday. It is a special week. It's Passion Week. It's Holy Week. And I know that a lot of you today see this as a special time to be in church. And I sure do as well. Um, You know, a lot of people in the ministry, uh, people who work in churches and the businesses that supply churches, uh, they often put a lot of pressure on pastors and churches during this one week of the year. Say, it's Easter. Everything's got to be perfect. It's got to be the best that it can be. It's Easter Sunday. And that's usually when you hear a common phrase around this time in the church world every year. You hear Easter Sunday is like the Super Bowl Sunday for churches. Which, if I'm being honest, it's a lot of pressure. Easter Sunday is like Super Bowl Sunday. I didn't even know our church made the playoffs this year. I just thought we were going for high draft picks this season. So that said, I see this as an absolute win. We're just happy to be here. Um, But I guess in some ways, Easter Sunday is like Super Bowl Sunday. Each event takes place around the same time every year, but not exactly on the same date every year, but they're both always on a Sunday. There's often a lot of extra bells and whistles that are part and parcel of this one event. There's special chants and cheers for these Sundays, like, He is risen. risen Some of you know your lines. And some of us have special hats that we pull out just for this one Sunday. It's really not much difference. Uh, no, we, and, and we've also decided that eating a lot of calories on this one particular Sunday is part of the experience. Uh, by the way, a special reminder, all calories consumed on Easter Sunday are holy calories. And yeah, they just roll right away like the stone in front of Jesus' tomb. That's right. <clears throat> See, I'm glad you like it. My nutritionist was not buying into it, unfortunately. Uh, of course, in some ways... Uh, both Super Bowl Sunday and Easter Sunday are rituals. We do them every year. Most years we know what to expect to the point that some people have released Easter bingo cards to take with you to church on Sunday in case the service isn't holding your attention. Does anybody in here have one of those bingo cards today? Yeah, if you did, nobody wants to admit it, right? They're all kind of a variation on this theme. I know it's hard to to see, but I'll share some of them with you. So you've got spaces like Easter lilies. Mark your space. All right. Um, The song, Jesus Paid It All, if you're playing along. Yeah, you get to mark that one. Uh, Your one uncle who doesn't normally come to church. I don't know. That could be you, maybe. Uh, Get a space for that. Uh, Fancy hat. Yes. Anybody seen some fancy hats out there? All right. Uh, It's a good meme. So this year, somebody released a church staff bingo, Holy Week edition card. And for those of us who work in ministry, it's pretty good. Uh, Somebody who has worked in a church or is working in a church definitely created this. I'll show it to you guys here. Again, hard to see, but I'll just share some of my favorites. Um, Fighting over Last Supper reenactment roles. (laughs) Seen it happen. Uh, Tacky decorations that someone's grandma made. Sorry, grandma. Uh, My personal favorite, why is Jesus so white? Uh, Now, I'm actually happy that we don't have too many entries to circle on our card this year. Uh, But if we're being honest, I do have a few. Uh, Last minute Amazon order. Got to mark that space. Um, Let's hold off on that until after Easter has been my favorite phrase for the last several weeks. Allergic reaction to Easter lilies. Um, True. It's a hard day. Um, But a funny thing happened. Uh, One of the spaces on this card in particular caught my attention, and it really made me stop and think. It's this space right here. Realize you have nothing new to say about the resurrection of Christ. And it hit me. After 18 years in ministry... I had to mark that space. I had nothing new to say about Easter. 
I mean, after thousands of years and hundreds of thousands of pastors and theologians and historians and laymen and poets and filmmakers and authors and bloggers and singers and songwriters, what more new was there to say? What new thought or idea do I possibly have to offer? And I thought about this for a while. And I kind of wrestled with how I should feel about it. But then I thought some more and I went, you know, there's probably nothing new to say about the Super Bowl either, but we still have it and enjoy it every year because it's a celebration of the game of football. It's a day where football breaks through its usual boundaries and reaches out past its normal audience of sports fans and followers to the point where millions of eyes all over the world are focused on what football is all about. I thought some more. I thought, you know what? There's also not a lot new to say about the 4th of July. But we still celebrate Independence Day every year because it's a celebration of freedom and victory. And even if there's nothing new to say about it, what's happened and what it means are still worthy of fireworks. And Easter, what Jesus did and what that means, it's about freedom. It's about victory too. And it is always worthy of fireworks. The reason we don't have fireworks for Easter is because it scares all the bunnies and chicks. <laughs> that and that plastic grass stuff in the baskets is highly flammable. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> so uh, I advocated for fireworks for Easter. Uh, and it didn't happen. But can you imagine? Easter egg hunts would be a lot more interesting if some of the eggs had candy and other eggs had firecrackers that were about to go off. That's why I'm not in charge of a children's Easter festivities. Uh, but I digress. It, it doesn't matter that I don't have anything new to say. I can get up here and say the same things that other people have said, the same things that people have said for thousands of of years, because what's important is not the cleverness of my words or the presentation. What is important is what's behind three simple words. He is risen. So today, instead of hearing what I have to say, I would rather you hear what some of the people who were there for the resurrection and who encountered the risen Jesus way back when, I'd rather you hear what they have to say, starting with the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Peter says that because Jesus rose from the dead and conquered sin and death and hell, that we can be born again. We can have a new life in Christ and through Christ. And we are all sinners. We've all been separated from God's holiness by our sin. But because of the mercy of God and the mercy mission of Jesus, who came to set us free, who purchased the price for our sins on the cross and showed us that we could truly have the eternal life that he promised. Thanks be to Jesus, who gives us heaven that we can look forward to. And if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, no one can take that away. Our trophies, our prized possessions here on earth, they fade. They get old. They get dusty. They get broken. They decay. But the gift of eternal life and the place that Jesus has prepared for you, it stays perfect forever, beyond the reach of change or decay. That's what we have to look forward to. That's the gift that Christ procured on the cross and presented to us when he walked out of the tomb. A different translation of 1 Peter 1.3 says, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope because the resurrected Jesus is our living hope. And I hope that you leave here this Sunday taking hold of that living hope. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 6, Since we have been united with him in death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ, 
so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. The power of Easter is not just the power of the resurrection to grant us eternal life when we leave this earth. The power of Easter is the power over sin through the power of Jesus Christ working in our lives and his Holy Spirit being active and present in our lives. Paul said that we are no longer slaves to sin. Many of us know firsthand how destructive sin can be in our lives, in our relationships, the wedges it can drive between loved ones, the struggles that sin can produce at work, at home. The the barriers and the walls that sin builds between you and who you want to be. The blockade that sin creates that stops us from being who God truly meant us to be. Well, the power of Easter is the power of Christ, not only setting us free from death, but setting us free from the power of sin. We no longer have to succumb to sin. We don't have to give in to sin. Jesus has given us the power to resist that sin nature and to choose to live like him. And it may not always be easy, but Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Jesus conquering sin and breaking free of the grave means that through the power of his Holy Spirit, You can conquer sin and break free of the sinful patterns that have been holding you back. And instead, we can make a Jesus-led, spirit-fueled breakthrough in our lives. When Jesus came to set the captives free, he didn't just come to set us free from the wages of sin that leads to death. He came to free us from the power of sin itself. And the resurrection of Jesus means that we can lead transformed lives and have the abundant life that Jesus promised. The apostle Paul also said in Romans 8, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. There will be times, of course, because of our sin nature, that even though we can have power over sin through Jesus, we will still sadly succumb to it because we are not yet perfect like Jesus. We will all still make mistakes from time to time. We will all fall short of God's glorious standard. But Paul says that not only have we been made right through uh, the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, but because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father pleading on our behalf, there is no condemnation. And while our choices in this world will have consequences, we do not ever have to fear being separated from God's love. There's no condemnation, which means there is only love. Because there is no condemnation, there is no need for guilt or shame. When we mess up, we confess our sin to God, and we go about doing our best to live like Jesus again and asking for the Holy Spirit to help us. We will not experience condemnation when we make mistakes. We will only experience Love. Paul goes on to say this Can anything separate us from Christ's love? 
Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The story of Easter is the story of a God who loved us so much and a Savior who loved you so much that they made a way for us. The power of Easter is never-ending love, a love without end, a love that nothing, nobody, nowhere can ever separate us from. That is the love of Christ for you and for me. I want to finish today by reading the account from Luke 24 together. And I know it's a lot, but I think today is the day that we just need to see the power of what's written in scripture. There is no day like today. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away at the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. The angel said, he isn't here. He is risen. Remember what he told you back in Galilee. And the resurrection of Jesus is another occasion where God keeps his promises. Jesus keeps his promises. If Jesus says it, then Jesus will do it. That means when Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That means he will give you rest. It means when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. That means you will have the light of life. It means he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it because Jesus keeps his promises. Let's continue with Luke 24. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back to the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, 
You foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn with us as he talked with us on the road and explained this to him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you so frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see, but it's really me. Touch me, make sure that I'm not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There's forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. The resurrection of Jesus speaks for itself. I don't need to say anything new or clever because the gospels say all that we need to hear. He is risen. Yeah, somebody gets it, right? I slipped that one in there, right? As we leave here today, the simple fact of the matter is that more important than what I have to say about the resurrection, more pressing even than what the apostles have to say about the resurrection or what the authors of scripture have to say about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what you have to say about the resurrection. The apostle Paul said, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave that first Easter Sunday? More than that, do you think Jesus accomplished that just to give us another holiday? Another day to show up to church and see nice people and have a nice day eating a lot and finding eggs? Is Easter something that you're thankful for, but you don't really think about except for maybe around this time of year? Or do you understand that the resurrection of Jesus is the day we were set free from sin so we can have abundant life every single day of our lives? Do you understand the resurrection to be proof positive that our Lord keeps his promises? That Jesus' victory over sin and the grave means victory over sin and the grave in our own lives. Eternal life is secured through Jesus' resurrection, but abundant life comes when you declare Jesus as the Lord of your life every day and follow him every day, not just on Easter Sunday. Today, if you haven't done it already, if you want to declare Jesus the Lord of your life, if you want to make it official and accept his gift of eternal life when we leave this world and abundant life, my sins. Right now, I ask you to be my personal Savior. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to turn from my sins and follow you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I thank you for rising again three days later and taking those sins away. 
thank you for saving me. And thank you for preparing a place for me up in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time, or you feel like it's the first time that that you understood what it meant, I would love to know. Uh, I won't bother you. I won't spam you. But I would love to pray for you. And I'd love to celebrate the decision that you made here today. Uh, Come up and tell me after the service if you want. Or if you got to get out of here quick or you just prefer a different way, you can always give me an email. My email is josh at seacostredondo.com. And if there's something we can help you with, if you're looking for next steps as a new believer or even as a long-time believer, uh, please give me an email. Also, today, if you've still got questions, you're, you're looking for some answers, maybe you're close to putting your faith and trust in Jesus, but you're still not sure about some things, uh, I want to encourage you to check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we did a series a while back called Finding My Faith or Refinding My Faith. It's got good reasons to believe in God and Jesus, reasons to have faith, reasons to believe that the whole thing is true. So if you can't find what you're looking for there, you can give me an email and I'll do my best to point you in the right direction. But you can check that out if you've got some questions. I'm, again, so blessed that you are all here today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with us. Um, if this is your first time here, uh, we're open most Sundays. Um, <laughs> truthfully, each week we come in, we praise, and we worship together. We try and keep it fun and interesting and engaging, and we leave it to Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit to be life changing. We're a group of people who love our neighbor and who love Jesus. And if that sounds like something you'd like to be a part of, we'd love to have you be a part of it. So come on down any other Sunday. Uh, If you can't make it, you can always join us online. But for now, may the joy of the resurrection lift us from our loneliness, weakness, and struggles. May we experience the beauty and strength and happiness of our resurrected Savior every single day. God bless you all. Happy Easter. Take a look at the screens.